Now more than ever, the United States needs protest songs. Bingo. Police can't catch me this up. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. In just the past few months, many of the issues plaguing our nation have been brought to the forefront of the national conversation by pop culture's most notable figures. Imagine there's no heaven. Okay, maybe some of these are better than others. The concept of a protest song is not a new one. From songs about the defects of the Bush administration, to the treatment of Vietnam veterans, to women's rights and black empowerment, the hit protest record is nothing new in American music. Indeed, protest songs are an essential part of America's musical culture. One of our nation's most ubiquitous songs, Yankee Doodle Dandy, was one of the first protest songs in U.S. history, and that came out in the 1700s. But what was America's first protest song that was actually a hit recording? The song that pushed the commercial and artistic boundaries of what protest music could even be. That song is Strange Fruit, a unique and polarizing song from 1939. But to fully understand the record, we'll have to go back and explore the history of its singer, its writer, and America's ugly tradition of lynching. The cultural precursors to lynching came from British colonists in the 17th and 18th centuries, who brought with them a tradition of extrajudicial mob punishment such as tarring and feathering. These non-lethal practices eventually evolved into lynching, a practice in which vigilantes would kill someone accused of a crime outside the court system. Prior to the American Civil War, most victims of lynching were actually white men. After the American Civil War, the South was defeated militarily, but not culturally. As African Americans were freed from slavery by the 13th Amendment, granted citizenship by the 14th Amendment, and promised the right to vote by the 15th Amendment, white Southerners, both those who had formerly profited off slave labor and those who did not, quickly found a scapegoat for their newfound economic hardships. Almost immediately, lynchings in the South became overwhelmingly carried out by white mobs against black people. According to the Tuskegee Institute, between 1889 and 1940, 3,833 people were lynched in the U.S. 90% of these took place in the South, and 80% of the victims were black. This is a conservative estimate. African Americans were denied trial and executed by lynching for alleged crimes such as theft, rape, and murder without any evidence or due process. As if this weren't bad enough, and name cultural differences, such as insulting white people, flirting with white people, acting above one's rank in society, doing well financially, or just being uppity, were all valid excuses for black people to be lynched. Again, no evidence was required. A simple accusation was enough. Lynching was used to perpetuate a culture of white supremacy and intimidate African Americans from voting. Even though local governments sometimes acknowledged the illegality of lynching, perpetrators were rarely charged. While it is uncomfortable to talk about something as horrific and charged as the history of lynching, I believe it would be a disservice to gloss over. It is the very essence of strange fruit, and there is no place for ignorance about it. That said, for the next minute or two, we'll be going into detail. The typical method of lynching was hanging, though many victims were also beaten to death, shot, or burned alive, sometimes even a combination of the four. There are documented cases of victims being raped and bodily mutilated as well. We often imagine that these murders were carried out clandestinely in the middle of the night by hooded members of the Ku Klux Klan, but it's important to note that this was not the norm by any means. Lynchings were often carried out in broad daylight by hundreds or thousands of members of the community. Said journalist H.L. Mencken, lynchings took the place of the merry-go-round, the theater, the symphony orchestra, and other diversions common to large communities. Crowds would pose with the defiled bodies for photographs and even send them as picture postcards. This postcard depicts the 1915 lynching of Will Stanley. The sender casually refers to the photo as the barbecue we had last night. Lynching continued for decades after the Reconstruction era. While it primarily took place in the South, lynching was often overlooked or treated as a joke by many in the North, considering it yet another trait that made the South backward. 
Despite years of campaigning by the NAACP, a federal anti-lynching law could not be passed. In August 1930, two young black men from Marion, Indiana, Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith, were arrested on allegations of robbery, murder, and rape. The following night, a mob broke into the jail with sledgehammers and lynched the two, leaving their bodies to hang on a tree for hours. No one was charged for the killing, and the rape allegations were subsequently withdrawn. It seemed to be yet another senseless act of violence, but it would ultimately prove to be catalytic for one of America's most important protest songs. Now let's fast forward a few years to 1936, when Abel Mirapol was a 33-year-old English teacher living in the Bronx. Mirapol was a prolific writer, composer, and poet, but hadn't produced anything that had made much of an impact outside of leftist circles. Mirapol and his wife, Anne, were communists, and much of Mirapol's work skewed far left of typical American politics. It was in 1936 that Mirapol saw a photograph of Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith's lynching. Filled with rage, he wrote a poem titled Bitter Fruit, which was published in Teachers Union publications as well as the Marxist journal The New Masses. The poem, which was later retitled Strange Fruit, used the imagery of fruit growing on a tree as a euphemism for the hanged bodies of African-American lynching victims. Said Mirapol, I wrote Strange Fruit because I hate lynching, and I hate injustice, and I hate the people who perpetuate it. Mirapol believed the poem could work well as a song, too. Though he often had others put his words to music, he insisted on trying himself as he felt the piece was very important. The song was performed mostly at leftist gatherings and by some black performers, but had yet to make a broader impact or reach a wider audience outside of those circles. It would take quite a performer to bring a song like this to the masses. Enter Billie Holiday. Born in 1915 to a life of poverty and abuse, Holiday began singing as a young teenager in Harlem nightclubs before being discovered in 1933 by record producer John Hammond. Inspired by Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong, Holiday was known for her unique improvisational singing style, which she developed without any formal training. Hammond arranged for Holiday to record with some of the day's more popular band leaders, such as Benny Goodman and Teddy Wilson, introducing her talent to a national audience. She got her big break touring with superstar band leaders Count Basie and Artie Shaw, scoring some of her biggest hits during this time. She didn't always get on with her collaborators, however. Basie fired her from his band for reportedly unprofessional behavior, while she quit Shaw's due to the discrimination she faced as the only black member of an otherwise all-white band. Although most of her records in the 1930s were released under the name of the band leader, as was common at the time, she did have enough notoriety to occasionally record as a lead act herself. It was this newfound fame that allowed her to land a gig at Cafe Society in 1938. Unlike many Manhattan clubs of the day, Cafe Society was integrated. Owner Barney Josephson's vision for the club was a place to mock a lot of then mainstream ideas like racism, classism, and celebrity worship. Maybe we could use more places like this today. In 1938, Josephson and producer Bob Gordon discovered Mirapol's Strange Fruit and asked Holiday to perform it. It was there, on the smoky dance floor of Cafe Society, that the definitive version of Strange Fruit was born. Though Holiday was initially uncomfortable performing the song, it quickly became an integral part of her set. The music was likely rewritten, and Holiday, as always, warped the vocal melody to her liking. Josephson arranged special instructions for its performance as the final song of her tri-nightly set. All service was halted, and any patrons who weren't quiet were asked to leave. The room went completely dark, and then a pin spotlight was cast on Holiday's face. She would then sing Strange Fruit, and the lights would cut out immediately after her performance. She would not return for an encore or bow, regardless of the applause. In Josephson's words, people had to remember Strange Fruit, get their insides burned with it. Holiday quickly laid claim to the song and disliked when others, such as Cafe Society performer Josh White, performed it. Recognizing Strange Fruit as Holiday's new signature song, it was even advertised by name in newspapers. The song was destined to be recorded, even though Holiday's producer John Hammond didn't like the song, and her record label, Columbia, wanted nothing to do with it, presumably not to alienate Southern record buyers. Instead, Holiday convinced Milt Gabler of Commodore Records, a small left-wing indie label run out of a music store, 
to let her record the song. After a four-hour recording session in a Midtown Manhattan studio, the fury of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit was finally distilled on wax. The imagery of Strange Fruit is haunting. Mirapol's lyrics illustrate the dehumanization of African Americans, describing the lifeless black bodies of lynching victims hanging from trees left out to decompose in the elements. The suggestion that the bodies are a fruit naturally born of southern trees is particularly disturbing to this day. Strange Fruit also offers a scathing critique of the notion of a picturesque and hospitable South. Released in 1939, the same year that saw Gone with the Wind glamorize the antebellum South as a lost age of beauty and chivalry, the lyrics suggest that someone's enjoyment of those idealistic Southern landscapes could be ruined by the scent of a lynching victim's burning flesh. It would have been natural for a singer to take this material in a woozily sad direction. I've been dancing with tears in or as a powerful blues lament. But that simply wasn't Billie Holiday. What I love about Holiday's work is the emotion and wit she brought to every performance. She sells the listener love, heartbreak, and pain all with the skill of a dramatic lead, but imbues every syllable with the intelligence of a Greek chorus. Holiday knew just when to massage a syllable to send a message. On some of her finest recordings, she somehow manages to bare her soul to the audience all while simultaneously giving them a knowing wink. But this song isn't like other Billie Holiday songs either. She still warps the lyrics like no other, but her wistfulness is omitted in favor of fury. People mistake this song as being sad just because it's slow and restrained, but if you really listen to the record, it's clear that Holiday is mad. She's a woman on a mission. She spares a listener the theatrics and delivers fiery lyrics with an ice-cold resolve. Instead of histrionics, she treats the subject matter with pure contempt. Strange Fruit is the musical equivalent of Holiday staring you dead in the eye for two straight minutes. The steeliness of the song doesn't leave me feeling empowered or angry or sad. After the cold, unresolved vocalization of Crop, it leaves me feeling hollowed out, empty, and hopeless. There are elements of jazz, blues, and folk here, but Holiday's definitive, minimalist recording doesn't fit neatly into any of those categories. The technical recording quality does not match that of Holiday's contemporary work and major labels, giving the record a tarnished and distant kind of feel. It's truly a piece of art all its own. Released in mid-1939 with Fine and Mellow on the B-side, Strange Fruit unsurprisingly struck a nerve with many people. After finally hearing Holiday perform his work, Abel Mirapol said, This is exactly what I wanted the song to do, and why I wrote it. Billie Holiday's styling of the song is incomparable and fulfilled the bitterness and shocking quality I had hoped the song would have. Many jazz critics and contemporaries of the time, however, reviewed Strange Fruit unfavorably, noting that it was unlike Holiday's usual fare. Jazz scholar Martin Williams called it moving propaganda, perhaps, but not poetry and not art. Jerry Wexler said he loved the message, but said it didn't offer anything melodically, while John Hammond, Holiday's own producer, said it was artistically the worst thing that ever happened to Holiday. Leonard Feather of Melody Maker called it grim and moving, while Variety called it propaganda in swing time and depressing in two separate reviews. A downbeat magazine critic said, Perhaps I expected too much of Strange Fruit, the ballyhooed tune which, via gory wordage and hardly any melody, expounds an anti-lynching campaign. At least I'm sure it's not for Billy. The highest mainstream praise came from the New York Post critic Samuel Grafton, who said, If the anger of the exploited ever mounts high enough in the South, it now has its Marseillaise. There weren't any national billboard charts in the 1930s, but it's feasible that Strange Fruit was a moderate hit in the United States. Chart historian Joel Whitburn retroactively ranked the song as a number 16 hit in his book Pop Memories, though the historical accuracy of this book has been disputed. Several quotes from David Margolik's book on Strange Fruit suggest that the song was popular only among the liberal elite and black intellectuals, but the book also notes that many teenagers around the country were attracted to the song because of its taboo subject matter. 
Conflicting reports of the song either being a million seller or a niche favorite suggest that it probably falls somewhere in the middle. There are many tales of this recording being banned on the radio, but there are no definitive records of this ever happening. That said, it goes without saying that this song certainly sold more copies than it was ever played on the air, as there are many accounts of radio DJs having to fight to play the song. Advocates of a federal anti-lynching law sent copies of the song to members of Congress, where Southern senators were about to filibuster yet another anti-lynching bill to stop it from being passed. The New York Theater Arts Committee sent copies of Strange Fruit to senators, claiming that millions of Americans had found it terribly and strangely moving. If one thing is for sure about Billie Holiday's life, it is that she and Strange Fruit would be forever intertwined, both publicly and privately. Holiday was so attached to the song that she reportedly listened to her recording of it with friends, falling into a deep melancholy when doing so. She later made various claims that the song was written especially for her or that she had written it herself, although we know this isn't true. And now I'd like to sing a tune. It was written especially for me. It's titled Strange Fruit. I do hope you like it. Songwriter Irene Wilson claimed to have seen Holiday break a chair over an audience member's head after he made an obscene joke about the song. Drummer Lee Young said Holiday didn't like to sing it because it hurt her so much. She had enough hurt to go around from her struggles with addiction and abusive relationships. Besides, the song seemed to make her just as many enemies as it did friends. But one tradition remained. Whenever she did perform it, it was always her closing number. Vernon Jarrett, an influential journalist, described seeing Holiday perform the song live. It was indescribable, man. She was standing up there singing this song as though this was for real, as if she had just witnessed a lynching. That's what knocked me out. I thought she was about to cry. She was looking at no one in the audience. She could have been a little high, like she was singing to herself. This is for me. Fuck all of you. She impressed me as someone who had also been wronged, as if she'd been lynched herself in some fashion or another. When I heard her sing, I heard other kinds of lynchings, not just hanging from the trees. I saw my own mother and father, two college-educated people, and all the crap they had to go through. To me, that was part of the whole lynch syndrome, the lynching of the body and spirit put together. That's the way her face looked when she sang that. I don't think it was just that she was high. She was making her peace with her own lynched existence. Holiday earned $1,500 for the four songs she recorded that day for Commodore Records, though the small label never turned its back on her. If ever she needed money, Commodore would give her cash right out of the register. Holiday would record Strange Fruit four more times during her lifetime, although none quite captured the subtlety of the original. As the years go by, you can hear Holiday's voice wearing thinner in each subsequent recording from her years of alcohol and drug abuse. In 1959, at the age of 44, 20 years after she first recorded Strange Fruit, Billie Holiday died penniless, handcuffed to a hospital bed. I hope to tell her story in full someday on this channel. Songwriter Abel Mirapol saw some success, writing a few songs that were recorded by Peggy Lee and Frank Sinatra but nothing ever came close to the success or importance of Strange Fruit. He and his wife are otherwise best remembered for adopting the orphans of executed Adam spies Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. For all the record's importance as one of the first songs directly addressing racism and white supremacy, its legacy didn't seem to immediately translate to the civil rights movement just one generation later. The baby boomer generation's protest songs were more hopeful and positive, whether they be updated classics, stirring soul ballads, but I know a change gonna come. or even a dance record that took on a new meaning. Strange Fruit did, however, grow in statue as the years passed on. Ahmet Ertegun, 
Founder of Atlantic Records called it a declaration of war, the beginning of the civil rights movement. Civil rights activist Angela Davis said the song put the elements of protest and resistance back at the center of contemporary black musical culture. A 1944 Lillian Smith novel about interracial relationships was named Strange Fruit after the song. Holiday's recording was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1978, and the December 31, 1999 issue of Time named it Song of the Century. Nina Simone's 1965 recording is the first notable cover and probably the last great one. Strange fruit hanging. Said Simone, the ugliness of it, that is about the ugliest song I have ever heard. And perhaps it's a lack of that understanding that has caused so many of the song's subsequent covers, in my opinion, to miss the mark. Diana Ross recorded the song for her portrayal of Billie Holiday in the 1972 biopic Lady Sings the Blues. While Ross gives an otherwise excellent performance, her voice is just too sweet and warm to convey the message of strange fruit. For the tree. This film also perpetuates the story that Holiday wrote the song herself. Further covers came from dozens of artists, including Jeff Buckley, Strange fruit hanging from the pop. Susie and the Banshees. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. And UB40. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. But they all miscarry, in my opinion. While I generally love covers that take a song in an original direction, every embellishment comes across as a stain on the song's message to me. Strange Fruit is an ugly song that doesn't need any ornamentation. Singer Andre Day, who is set to portray Holiday in another upcoming biopic, also covered the song in 2017. Unsurprisingly, it's hip-hop that is keeping the message and spirit of Strange Fruit alive today. Dozens of rap songs name drop, interpolate, or sample the song, many of them from just the past five years. Perhaps most affected was the multi-talented Lena Horne. On lynching, Horne said, When I was a little girl, I knew about the fear it aroused in my people and in my mother. It was something that I wanted to forget. She was putting into words what so many people had seen and lived through. She seemed to be performing in melody and words the same thing I was feeling in my heart. She was angry. Many people realized the tears weren't doing any good. If Strange Fruit forced Horn to remember the horrors of lynching, it was worthwhile, as she went on to work with Eleanor Roosevelt to get anti-lynching laws passed. In turn, Strange Fruit paved the way for a greater appreciation of protest songs. Dorian Linsky writes in 33 Revolutions Per Minute, A History of Protest Songs, Up until this point, protest songs functioned as propaganda, but Strange Fruit proved they could be art. If you want to know more about Strange Fruit, there's plenty out there. For hundreds of quotes, recollections, and conflicting accounts about the song, I highly recommend David Margolik's Strange Fruit, The Biography of a Song which was one of my primary sources for this video. If I had written this piece a few years ago, I might have naively ended it with a and thank God we don't lynch people anymore and called it a day. But that would have wholly missed the point. As long as Black Lives Matter is still a controversial statement, we still need strange fruit. In a place where arguing that the police should be held accountable for their unlawful actions against black people is taken as a political statement, we still need strange fruit. In a nation that sees protesters for racial equality mocked, belittled, tear-gassed, and even run over, we still need strange fruit. When black people can be killed for selling cigarettes, using a fraudulent check, jogging, playing in a park, answering the door, leaving the door ajar, eating ice cream at home, or even sleeping in bed, we still need strange fruit. For generations, strange fruit was too forgotten, too grim, too taboo, or too mishandled to have the legacy it deserves. 
Only within my lifetime do I believe it's finally gotten the critical reevaluation and widespread acclaim it merits. If you didn't know the song before this, just close your eyes, play it, and let Billy speak. This is a record we can't afford to forget. Mm -hmm. 